Good morning, everyone. I am sorry to say that you can't see me right now. Um, our, we use this platform called GoToWebinar and it has worked fantastically in previous uh, webinars. Uh, but this morning we seem to ha be having a bit of an issue just with the camera function. So I'm pretty sure you can all see my uh, slide deck, which is more important, let's be honest. Um, but I apologize that for now you cannot see my face not that my face matters but anyways um we do have someone working on that in the background and hopefully by the time we at least get to the q a part we will be able to um be face to face uh with that little bit aside good morning thank you all so much for joining us here uh on tuesday morning i hope everyone had a good easter weekend um and i'm here with scott treblecock of core mining and uh excited to do a little presentation. So I'm just going to spend 10 minutes going through my current outlook on the markets, which has, I mean, I have to admit that I'm sort of exhausted trying to track the markets and understand what's going on over the last five or six weeks has been um, quite the task. Um, and it's changed for gold investors for the better in the last few days, for sure. I mean, gold is having a fantastic few days right now. Um, and so I had to amend my presentation this morning, certainly to reflect that. So I just want to go through my outlook on the markets. And then I think Scott and I will chat for a moment. And then I will let Scott jump into um, the core mining story. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the story. And I'm sure Scott will take that in stride and focus, at least to some extent, on, on what's coming and how core fits into the uh, current market outlook. So with no further ado, um, a health crisis, an economic catastrophe, and a golden opportunity. I could just stop there. I mean, I think, <laughs> I'm kidding. But um, I obviously use that headline because I think that captures where we are and, uh, and where we're going. And so I'm not going to spend much time looking backwards or looking at the uh, sort of overall situation, but I do what I kind of what I've decided that I like to focus on in framing these discussions is why the market crash was so intense and why it is changed now. And I think the key there is that what happened is that we were, we as a, as a world, were forced to undergo what I'm calling like a rapid negative paradigm shift. So a paradigm shift is something that's very difficult for us to accept. It was very difficult for us to accept that germs cause disease, not bad air. That was the previous thinking. It was very difficult to accept that plate tectonics was how the world, uh, how the earth functioned. Um, it's very difficult for people to accept paradigm shifts, and especially if they're forced upon us quickly. And that is exactly what happened to start this year. If you'd asked around in December, I think almost no one, perhaps epidemiologists accepted, would have thought that a cold virus could cripple the world the way that it has. Um, and so that's a paradigm shift. It's so hard for us to accept when it is very difficult for us to accept a change that's happening. It's we can't we can't um, adjust to it appropriately. And so there was panic. And that panic is what caused the market crash of epic proportion. Um, and the key though, is that now we are in the new paradigm. We are not, it is not washing over us, um, drowning us, so to speak, but we are currently, we are now in the new paradigm. It's uncomfortable. There's lots of unknowns still, but we're in it. Um, and so that's really important. And um, what that means is that going forward, I believe, the overall investor market reaction will be more um, in context. It will re people will respond to data points, they will respond to outlooks, they will respond to events, but it's not, I think peak panic is over. And the reason that's important is that I do think there's another bottom ahead for the broad markets, but I don't think we will go crashing down there in anything like the way that we did to the previous bottom, to the bottom that we had in March. Um, why do I think that there's another bottom? Well, when this all started, the big question is what shape is this going to take? It started as an event-based crash. Um, it had the potential to become something bigger and longer and worse, but we had unprecedented monetary and fiscal response, and that has largely erased the potential 
for this to change from an event-based crash into something bigger, into a structural recession. The Fed is basically nationalizing the markets. It's even buying high yield debt now, um, and it will buy as much as needed to keep things working. So that makes a huge difference. The key, a key one is that I do not think the corporate bond market is going to implode, for example, which it could well have done without the monetary response that we got from the Federal Reserve. So um, that's a huge impact. And then there's all the fiscal um, spending. And so there's helicopter money, there's all kinds of support for unemployment and for businesses. Um, there's going to be large um, infrastructure spending. The scale of the response happens. It certainly doesn't solve everything, but it really helps. And so those two moves, those two angles of approach have really uh, helped the market's bottom. I don't think we're out of the woods yet. I think we're currently in a calm, rising, bounce situation. Um, but the flood of terrible data that's to come, I think, I do not think that the markets can continue to rise through that. I mean, we're going to have major losses, dividends disappearing, share buybacks are going to disappear. Share buybacks have been a really important force in the um, broad bull market to date. Companies that get money from these bailouts will not be allowed. To execute share buybacks so these sorts of changes i think are significant and um will mean that i believe we're going to go down into another bottom i think one good um a po uh, forecast to to capture that is i mean one person ray dalio thinks corporate losses from the crisis will be in the range of four trillion dollars which is 20 percent of us gdp in losses so that's the kind of you know, terrible data that is coming. And so I don't think that markets are going to be able to continue to rise through that. I don't think that the overall market is going to be a V-shaped bottom. And on the um, health side of things, um, you know, the curves are starting to turn over. There's a lot that's still unknown. Um, you know, the US and UK daily deaths are still trending upward. Um, things have started to improve in Italy, Spain, and France, which is great. Um, there's a lot that we still don't know, right? Those, so we still don't know whether there's going to be a second wave, when restrictions come off, all of these things. Um, and so um, I, I have been very impressed with human ingenuity. I mean, I read just this morning that um, a major lab in the UK thinks that there could be a, a, um, a vaccine available available by the fall, which would be incredibly fast. Um, so human ingenuity is responding um, in a, an amazing way. But at the end of the day, I think there's still a lot of bad to come in the big picture, but it is literally a perfect storm for gold. So huge market crash, but after an immense bull market, so there's lots of money in general around, the people who have money, the great financial crisis was not very long ago, and they remember how much people made who invested near the bottom of the great financial crisis. So there's a lot, there's a lot of keen bottom pickers out there, which is one of the things that's fueling the bounce. And those bottom pickers are the type of investors who know that gold bottoms first in crises. Then you add in this essentially infinite money printing that we have going on right now, and very negative real interest rates. Those are fundamentally bullish for gold. Um, and then on top of that, you have the fact that current gold miners mean, current gold prices mean that gold miners make very good money today. And so as investors return to investing, gold miners will stand out across equities for the strength of their balance sheets and their cash flows. And then they offer leverage to a rising gold price on top of that. So I really think that it's a perfect storm for gold. Now, I just said that the markets are going to go down, but the gold is set up perfectly. So how does that go together? Well, that peak panic that we had for the initial bottom pulled everything down. Panic means that investors sell without much thinking, baby, bathwater, all of that. Um, in a second bottom that is more of a slide, more of a measured step down in response to data, there is an opportunity there for gold to act differently, specifically for gold to act as a hedge, as a safe haven, as the um, play the role that it is meant to play. 
and I was waiting to see whether that slide to the bottom for the to the second bottom for the broad markets would happen soon or take some time. It's taking some time. That has that time has allowed gold to gain some momentum. Um, and so you put that together, and I think that gold is going to trade through the next bottom with strength. I mean, it may get pulled down if there's a particularly bad day here or there, but I really do think that the bottom is in for gold. Gold is currently the only reliable bull market out there, and investors are coming in. This chart is a thing of beauty <laughs> this six month gold price chart obviously there was a hiccup there called covid um but this is a thing of beauty okay so if you do have that perspective i clearly do um what do you buy well the sort of um classic answer but the answer that makes a lot of sense to me is that you ride the tide. I mean, gold majors and royalty companies are the first to be bought when generalist money rotates into gold. That is always the case. And the reason is that the money that's rotating in is often from big funds, from pensions, from big hedge funds, and they cannot invest in small companies. They require large companies because they have to take big share positions. They need to be, they need to be able to trade those positions, so they need liquidity. They don't have particular exp expertise in exploration, and they usually have requirements. At a very minimum, the stocks that they invest in have to have a PEA level project or a hundred million dollar market cap, things like that. And so that's why the money rotates into the big miners first. And I mean, this is just Barrick's share price chart. I mean, look at that. That is, again, a thing of beauty. It is well beyond its pre-COVID peak, and that is because Generalist money is already coming in. Funds can't just sit around and wait for things to get better. They need to be active. They need to take advantage of opportunity. And the only advantage that they can take right now, I believe, the only reliable one, is investing in gold miners. And so that's what they're doing. And that's what's pushing Barrick up through the roof. So um, I think if you've already invested in some of these majors and gold majors and royalty companies, that's going to work out very well for you. What else can we buy? Well, um, what I was just speaking about were generalist dollars and they, why they rotate into large stocks. There are also a lot of focused gold investors and they are very active already. They, in general, are not buying Barrick. Instead, they're stepping down one level. Perhaps they're buying smaller operators, so single mine operators who maybe they think are takeout targets. Um, uh, or and or they are buying developers um, and optionality plays. And so I just, for two examples, obviously we're speaking about Core today. So I included Core's share price chart in there and I included Bluestone. I think they're just two examples of development level plays that attract that kind of interest from the focused gold investors who are very active because they, just like everyone else, want to take advantage of this crash opportunity and so those rebounds are phenomenal um what i think is important though is don't think that you've missed out yes there was a great move i mean if you managed to buy core at 17 cents good for you you're already up at 39 cents today that's fantastic but i think core is going well beyond 39 cents i think bluestone is going well beyond a dollar 80 as part of the recovery but more importantly because we are in an incredible gold bull market opportunity right now gold had really good fundamentals before covid hit covid has made those fundamentals way stronger i would say gold is sort of bulletproof now when it was only strong before uh as a last point uh, i haven't talked about the little stocks yet the exploration stocks now some of them have started to bounce many of them have not recovered much as yet the reason is that small juniors are the most at risk in the event that the major markets do slide again, because when that happens, risk tolerance just poof, evaporates, and guess what? Small juniors are just a touch risky. Looking ahead, I think through the North American summer, um, we have some catalysts that are coming that should help lift gold explorers. Um, help start them on the rise, help them to start participating in this gold bull market. So 
we have exploration results. Those come in the summer for those North American explorers. We will have money rotating down. Um, the large generalist funds won't rotate down that much. They'll rotate down to some extent, but they still need the stocks to be quite big. But the focused gold investors will absolutely rotate their money down from the rocks golds, the single mine explorers, the mid-tier explorers, even the developers down into the explorers who still are at very inexpensive prices. Um, and then we have um, M&A um, potential. Certainly, I believe that these strong balance sheets and these price opportunities mean that major miners and mid-tier miners are going to get active on the deal-making front in the next little while because that's the opportunity that they're faced with. Um, so should you invest in explorers right now it's completely up to you and, and up to your risk tolerance um i would say if there's a list of explorers that you really like where you think that there's good exploration results likely this summer where you think that they are going to um, attract some of those dollars that rotate down simply from the quality of their projects the potential of their exploration if you think that they're m a targets um i wouldn't say there's a lot of risk in um, moving into those stocks now, if the broad markets slide in a major way, uh, then some of these juniors will get pulled down to some extent as well, but they're already pretty darn cheap. I would also note that there will be some good financing opportunities. So good explorers who need money in order to be able to do work this summer will do financings at these low prices because they will not be willing to miss the drill season that's ahead. They're entering into a strong gold market and they will not be willing to miss the exploration season in that setup. So if you are an accredited investor who likes participating in financings, I would pay attention anytime there's a stock that you like, certainly consider whether that group needs to raise money and get in touch with them or ask me, something like that. And we'll see if we can, uh, and, and just, pay attention to the fact that there may be a financing angle into it and not only a market opportunity. At the end of the day, the COVID crisis, as I said, is only making what were very strong fundamentals in gold stronger. And I really think that precious metals and precious metal stocks will shine coming forward. I quickly, it's totally off topic because we're really supposed to be talking about gold, but I do want to note that uranium has good potential at this point to also run out the gate, which is super fun because multi commodity markets like gold and uranium and silver um, are more fun and go, are stronger than um, gold only markets. This would be a presentation on itself, but there's a huge amount of supply that's been erased because of COVID. And now um, this morning, Cameco said Cigar Lake is suspended indefinitely, which is no surprise. I said just a few days ago that that was likely. Um, and so uranium, it's a bull market that's been setting up for several years. Now it looks like it might be here. Um, not today, but it's building. It's happening. And when uranium bull markets go, they go absolutely crazy. So uh, as much as it's been a sort of stressful, tiring <laughs> month or two here, I think um, it's created an opportunity that uh, we will remember for a long time. And so that's what uh, that's what keeps me engaged. That's what keeps me excited. And that's what keeps me wanting to do events like we're doing right now for those who are interested in taking advantage of this opportunity. These are, of course, the um, publications that I produce. There's a weekly letter. There's a monthly letter that's designed for more generalist investors. There's an, uh, a service that gives access to financings when I am participating. And I never take money from companies. I just write about what I am buying and selling. So with that, um, I can see from my screen, at least, that we still unfortunately don't have webcams that are functioning. So um, I wanted to uh, just bring Scott into the conversation. Hasn't been a conversation yet. It's been a monologue. Um, and just as we transition over to him and presenting the core story, um, I was going to ask Scott, what, what, Scott, what were you doing in the last um, the great financial crisis and uh, sort of I think it's an interest I've been asking a lot of people what lessons they took from the great financial crisis I mean in terms of industry how companies reacted what opportunities stood out from others um, yeah I, it may seem a bit out of the blue but what lessons did you take from the last financial crisis that you think 
um, that are that are sort of arising for you right now that are uh, that you're looking at and hoping that you can take advantage of here. Yeah, hey Gwen. Uh, yeah, it's an it's an interesting question. You certainly made me made me ponder f sort of far back in in my memory banks. And I think, you know, at the time I happened to be at a company, it was also a startup, very growth oriented company that was you know raising money in in 07 08 ahead of the 08 crash and you know i think the key takeaway was you know when markets are open and available it is a great time you know to take money when capital is available and and build out companies and the company did incredibly well and was able to you know weather through the storm of 2008 because it had you know raised capital and taken its business far enough and in the end, you know, of course, it its stock got crushed like everything else, and then you know had a bit of a renaissance then after, thereafter. So, right. you know, I think markets are opening here in in the gold sector for smaller companies like Core, and there's an incredible opportunity to build, you know, value, use that capital to build value in assets. And I think Core has real assets to repeat, you know, what you can do when you hit a good market. Absolutely. Um, and I say, I mean, take capital when capital is available. You, when you joined Core, which must be getting on for a year ago now, um, you guys focused for the first half year of your tenure on making sure that there was money in the bank to to get things done. Um, and so Core has had already been operating on those principles. And that means that you're at least right now, you're in a position to to keep going forward. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, I ultimately joined the company. We've discussed this before because I believe Core has real assets, the real assets being almost 5 million ounces in the ground, the real assets being the Imperial project, which we saw the PEA come out on and we're now demonstrating. And we as owners beside shareholders are aligned in adding per share value through the effective deployment of capital into those assets. So I mean, that's how you build value in this sector and and i'm super excited to be here talking about it well let's give you the opportunity to talk about it a bit more um fully so i'm going to change over to i'm going to give you the presenter um hand over the baton here and i think you can now uh share your screen there we see your presentation so why don't you go through the story and uh what's new with core okay we will do Okay, well, thanks everyone out there. You're, it's probably actually a good thing you can't see my face. I'm in desperate need of a, of a haircut. <laughs> you know, one of my the most yeah challenging. They closed down obviously all the uh, personal care providers. I'm starting to look a little shaggy, so I'll take the uh, lack of uh, video participation as as a blessing. You can just listen to my voice instead. Um, so let me just. Uh, I put a few uh, together, a few slides specifically for this webinar. You just let me sort of walk through some of the things I'd like. There, there's my uh, pretty mug. Um, is ultimately, I think you want to understand, you know, why should I own own core mining? So I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, core and, and its value drivers. You know, we recently put out a preliminary economic assessment of our Imperial project, which showed a 343 million dollar net present value. For that project and you, you know how do we drive that value into the you know equity uh, value of core so i think that's a that's a fundamental thing to understand and then thirdly we also have in addition to the re the resources that were used to develop that pea we have an additional 2.6 million ounces in the ground how do we then use exploration to drive some of that value into the per share value of core shares. So hopefully you'll understand some of that. I'll try to keep this to um, 15 minutes, even though I have quite a few slides. And we can address anything else, obviously, in a dialogue and, uh, and a question period. So fundamentally, core has real assets. And just like Gwen's buildup, they are all 100% owned gold assets. So first big Big thing, I put a little, I have a little sticky note in front of me here called the big seven, why invest in core? Well, first one, first one's gold. I don't have to believe you're the gold price. Second one is real assets. We have almost 4.9, well, almost 5 million ounces in the ground, 2.5 million MI and 2.4 million inferred. 
Those are spread across three projects in safe and stable jurisdictions in British Columbia and California. And I'll talk about how we can unlock the value of those ounces in the ground through expiration and deployment of capital uh, to benefit shareholders. First off, we do have a plethora of expiration opportunities across this portfolio. You see up at FG Gold, at Long Valley, at Imperial, where those resources lie, there's opportunities to increase the quality and quantity of those resources. So that's how I think about it. When we talk about capital allocation, you know, what work do we do with our capital here at CORE? We think about number one, is the work we're doing going to increase the quality of the ounces, which we believe should, if, if marketed properly, translate into per share and value and market cap value of CORE. And we can also increase through the drill bit the quantity of those resources. So by increasing both quality and quantity through exploration, we can increase the per share value and market cap of core uh, to the benefit of shareholders, including ourselves. We also have the benefit of having an incredible PEA we put out last week. We've seen, I think, a, a mixture of reasons the stock respond well in the last uh, couple of weeks, but I think primarily driven by the fact that we dropped a big game-changing news release into the middle of a of a recovery in the, in the uh, gold market. You know, that PEA showed a potential value of 343 million of a 5% net present value, and that was done at 1450 long-term gold price. Obviously, there's a lot of leverage to the gold for that, uh, to that value to go up with increasing gold price, but let's just sort of pin it at uh, 1450 long-term, what a, you know, a major developer might actually build that project for, for capital uh, in the future. So how do we drive that value into the share price of core? Well, we take the project forward into development and I'll go through a few sides talking about that, but just sort of keep that in mind, two paths to development at core, exploration and development. Uh, so with my, my third big point, gold, yep, real assets, check, attractive valuation, check. And I updated this slide uh, about half an hour ago. So. Core is traded up from a 0.05 uh, NPV uh, to, or sorry, market cap to NPV valuation to a 0.075 with the recent value appreciation since we put out the PEA. So by no means has anybody missed the fundamental value driver for core at these valuation levels. And, and that includes zero value for expiration, that other, you know, 2.6 million ounces uh, in, in the ground. The peer companies for core trade at 0.3 times PNAV, and these peers are all developers. They all have projects uh, in the United States, and they all have varying levels of risk in those projects. And we are, you know, way down in the bottom there. And I think our project is better than average, and that's the kind of return I want to see generated for shareholders: is taking Imperial to a better than average valuation. Ultimately, by taking the project right through to permitting, you'd get one times PNAV and you can see the kind of potential value creation by going through that process. So big point number four, uh, core is aligned, insiders and management are aligned with shareholders. So management and the board still own 50% of the equity. That's because core is still very new. As Gwen mentioned earlier, we've only raised real capital twice in this company and both of those were with strategic investors. Uh, and that's sort of my, my next major point. We have backers for this company that are backing both paths to value creation. Macquarie Bank, who was the first money into the name, invested $4 million just under a year ago today to bring the Imperial project and move it forward to become a mine. Macquarie Bank did six months due diligence. They beat the heck out of management, you know, beating the leaves to make sure they feel that Imperial could become a mine because fundamentally, while they bought a bit of equity, they bought a 1% royalty on the project and a right to finance, because this is the debt component of the bank. They are a lending bank that lends money to companies to build projects. So there's an independent party that has said, yes, big checkbox, we believe Imperial will be a mine and, in the, and we're gonna invest in that. We then brought in Eric Sprott on a completely different investment thesis. His investment thesis was, wow, how do I get exposure to gold into an up gold market and get huge leverage to my investment? How do I see 5 million ounces? 
and I have them in my little math currently valued at less than $5 US an ounce. Peers trade 20 to $30 per ounce, and some companies trade far higher than that. That's the kind of returns Eric wants to see from his money, you know, multiples of, of the share price. So Eric's backing increased quality and quantity of resources and drill holes. Macquarie is backing development of an imperial. So we've got a shareholder base supportive of both and aligned management. A quick point on people. We can talk more about people if you have questions, but I think fundamentally the most important person uh, we've brought into the story is uh, Mark LaDuke. Mark is a heap leach expert with experience in California, a very, very rare combination. And he was the driving force behind Castle Mountain, which was eventually acquired by Equinox. And that mine is now being constructed. So Mark is the key guy advancing our Imperial project. We believe he can do it again uh, at core. I'll wrap the presentation at the end with my last two points on the what I call the big seven for investing in core. We have gold, we're in gold, we have real assets, we have an attractive valuation, we've got strategic backers of the company, we've got insider alignment. My last two, which I'll wrap with after I go through the assets a little bit, is we have catalysts. So we continue to, despite COVID-19, move our assets forward. We have a drill turning in a project in British Columbia. We've got uh, exploration results coming out on the Imperial Project Regional Exploration and we're moving Imperial into the permitting process in the middle of this year. So we've got catalysts coming up in the story and there's lots of exit points along the path here. So I know I've, Gwen, I've heard you say it, I'd like to address it head on in the uh, Q&A session. You know, you've said, you know, I'm not a big fan of permitting stories or, or something sort of to paraphrase your, your view. There's more to core number one than a permitting story, but even in that permitting story, giving where we're starting from, there's lots of exit points where you do not have to see that story through to the end. So we'll, we'll talk a bit about why, why I'm still buying stock in core. Okay, so a little bit about these real assets I've, I've talked about. This is a picture of Imperial Project. This is looking down the access road at where we plan to build the mine. I think it's you know pretty plain to see this is a, a good place to construct a mine for a lot of reasons. We, took, we were building off a 2.2 million ounce oxide resource, um, and I'll, I'll talk about why, why that's important in a sec very briefly. We did a preliminary economic assessment. Mark Leduc, who I mentioned, joined the company in about October. He put together a team of engineers that, uh, that he trusted and had worked with multiple times, and they have now delivered a PEA, and you can see the numbers on, on this slide. They speak for themselves. Fundamentally, the reason the numbers are so good, and, and I want to talk, convince you here that the numbers in that PEA, number one, are real, number two, that we can deliver on those numbers and therefore deliver that value to core shareholders. First is, you know, the project is simple. It's simple mining, it's simple processing, and it's simple infrastructure. It's an open pit mine. Uh, it's the waste being mined, so the non-ore component of the open pit mine is largely agglomerated alluvium, sand and gravel, which means it's it's easy mining. This is not hard rock, requires less blasting and keeps your cost down. We're mining multiple pits and, and uh, sequentially backfilling those pits, so we've got short hauls, and it keeps the mining really, really, really simple. We also have an operating mine called Mesquite that is nine miles away using the exact same class of truck and digging shovel that we plan to use. And we know the cost that they operate that equipment to the penny. So we know exactly what it's gonna to cost to move a ton of dirt at this project. It's also simple processing. It's called a run of mine heap leach, which means we dig the material out of the ground, we stack it on a heap leach pad, and we leach the gold out of that material. That's it, no crushing, no processing plant, no expensive capital, keep it very simple. And thirdly, uh, infrastructure. You know, Gwen's been been to visit the site. We were we were really happy to have her down in uh, January, and she got to see for herself. Uh, you see in the pictures here. There's a paved road that uh, almost leads right up to the gate of the project. You've got a power line that also feeds mesquite, running literally right over the claims of the project. You've got a water well on the left there, drilled by Glamis with a series of uh, monitoring wells around that. Uh, well, so there's, there's been tested, there's water, 
we've got uh, access to labor. You're only about uh, just less than an hour drive to the labor force that currently works at Mesquite just down the road and ultimately will provide skilled labor to this mine. So you don't need camps, there's nothing remote. This is simple, simple, simple. We also had a very credible team. So Mark put together a group of trusted engineers. They did fundamental engineering work on this mine plan. We did look at crushing to increase recoveries. We did look at a high pre-strip option to increase the NPV. We looked at very option, various options to comply with the backfilling of the pit which we'll talk about a bit in a moment. It's very important in California that you have to backfill open pit mines, which means we take all the material we dig out, we put it back in the hole of the ground, we cap it, and we leave the terrain very much like we le left it to only 25 feet to the original topography. The outcome of that was a low capital, low strip, simple run of mine, owner-operated fleet uh, mine. The result of that is we have one of the lowest capital intensity projects available in the market. So if you want to build a mine in the southwest U.S., these are the cheapest ounces you're going to get out of the ground for the capital you put into it. So great project. It also, you'll see in those PEA numbers, generates 146,000 ounces per year of gold and 1.2 million ounces life of mine, which also stacks up well against all the pure projects you see on this chart. We think it's going to be really exciting and really attractive for mid-tier miners looking for growth. They're going to be looking to the Imperial project. Um, when you look at the credibility of the numbers we put in the PEA, here's a chart that compares our operating cost forecast to that of the Mesquite mine, which is using the exact same class of truck and shovel. We appropriately have a slightly higher mining cost per ton, um, a slightly higher processing cost per ton because we're a slightly smaller mine, but only just and a slightly higher GNA because we're we're starting from scratch uh, on a slightly smaller mine. All net net, we should be able to deliver, deliver these numbers or better. And Mesquite is only nine miles down the road, been operating for 25 years, well established, and very similar sized mine to our Imperial project. Okay, so what are the next steps? Next steps for Imperials, we're immediately going to move the project into permitting. Um, and a lot of people are going to ask the question, we can discuss more in the Q&A, can you permit a project in California? That's the fundamental question. And clearly, and I'll, and I'll step back to my number one point, and one of the reasons I chose to join the company, invest my own money, is because Macquarie Bank did six months of due diligence and invested capital. They believe, and they are a credible third-party institution, that we can permit a mine in this environment, in California, in this location. And now that I've been in the company for, as Gwen mentioned, near, almost a year, you know, I agree just more and more. Uh, and some of the, the sort of reasons behind that is, you know, land use is well established in California. You know, over the last 20 years since this project was previously looked at by another operator, uh, California's implemented a whole array of desert protection measures uh, that protect the environment, that uh, hold back land from being developed. And the environmentalists have had a huge win in protecting California deserts. The good news is none of that overlaps this particular location. So as in everything, location is incredibly important. We are also located in Imperial County, which operates them, has the Mesquite mine currently. They also have a large open pit gypsum mine in the county. And previously they had multiple other gold mines. In fact, the original Equinox Gold, Ross Beatty's a gold company, not the current one, but his original 1980s and 90s Equinox Gold, developed the American Girl Mine, which is only eight miles south of our project in Imperial County. So Imperial County has a long history of gold mining. California as a state has moved forward multiple mining projects in the last five years. Soledad Milton Mountain was built from scratch, open pit, heap leach, gold mine. Castle Mountain is currently under construction by the, the modern Equinox Gold, Ross Beatty's gold company. They also own Mesquite down the road. And Sutter Gold have got a permit to build uh, their operation, although they're unsuccessful building their plant. That was their own problem. The permitting part of their project actually went very well. Another couple, another good tailwinds, obviously gold price. Uh, the pet previous operator of this project wasn't able to develop, develop the project in 2002 when the backfill law came in because gold was 300 bucks an ounce. And if you look at our current cost structure, backfilling, which rendered the project uneconomic at $300 gold, really costs you in today's dollars 120 bucks an ounce. So yes, it's a cost to core, it's all baked into the PEA, but today it's something that can be solved with money and the money is available when you're 
uh, running a project at 13, 14, 15, 1600 dollar gold, whatever number you want to use. Uh, Imperial County is also facing a large unemployment rate, which will probably be exacerbated, unfortunately, by COVID-19. And we believe we're going to come out of this in a, in a, into a U.S. environment that's very friendly to development and job creation. And I think it's going to be a really good environment to permit this mine in California. This is the value we're chasing to go through that permitting process. We're looking to get to $343 million in value or more because we've also got exploration opportunities in and around the project. And I'll talk to that briefly next. So moving quickly into some of the exploration opportunities that I, I touched on very early. I'm going to pound through these really quick because let's do it more in a, in a Q&A. CORE has the Mesquite Tipicacho Exploration District. We stake 20,000 acres around Imperial because this trend has been mined by Glamis at Picacho. It's currently being mined by Mesquite and Equinox up to the Northeast. We control all the ground in between. It's under sediment cover, so it has not been well explored in the past, and it's wide open for greenfield discovery. We've got a news release coming out in a couple of weeks on targeting underneath some of that cover, so we can get out there and do some drilling. We've got a great geophysical anomaly and some step outs from the current resource at Imperial. Here's a, a cross section of that great anomaly. And we're currently working with the BLM under a notice of intent to get drill pads to drill the regional targets and some of these untested near mine targets. We've also got that other 2.6 million ounces. Let's not forget about that. This is the projects that Eric Sprott funded and wanted to see us move forward on exploration. And we've gone out and done drill targeting at our Long Valley project in Central California. Here, the objective is to increase the quantity of the oxide resources that were previously drilled and test the sulfides underneath the project for higher grades and underground kind of grades that we could uh, add to the development plan for the project. So with very simple, very low risk drill holes, the oxide deposits right at the surface, the sulfides, there's some really good evidence where they are. We're currently permitting drill to go out there and expand that deposit and show that it is also a deposit worthy of value in the market cap of core. We'd like to get out there and drill in the second half of this year and generate uh, more news flow for our shareholders. The most current opportunity we're working on is the FG Gold Project in British Columbia. In the face of COVID-19, because we had a single drill turning and we were able to practice social distancing and the crew is working in a remote dedicated uh, accommodations, we're able to keep drilling. We've, the drill is still turning as we speak. The first holes are in the lab and we're excited to see the results. We are re-drilling the high-grade structures of this little gray triangle, which was all of the previous drilling done by previous operators. If we're successful in doing so and identifying the structural controls of that high-grade mineralization, we want to push that to depth underneath the depth of current drilling, open up this red rock group you see on this slide to exploration, open up this huge trend you see on surface in this yellow, orange and red trend and really create a brand new high quality BC gold project. Again, assays are in the lab, drill result and news releases expected in the near future. So taking all that back around to my, my top big six points to wrap up, Core is a gold company with 100% owned real assets. We have ounces in the ground and a PEA in our, our flagship project. We believe there's still a great valuation story here that could create incredible shareholder value. Insiders are aligned with you shareholders. We've been in the market buying stock re very recently. We've got alignment with our strategic shareholders to both development and exploration. We've got catalysts coming with the work we've been able to continue to do through despite COVID and coming out of that into a good market for capital. We'd like to continue to fund our programs and generating value for core shareholders. Let me wrap there and I'll turn it, I'll sort of invite Gwen back onto the line. I think we're going to do a little, uh, little Q&A and we can uh, beat through the key things on, on people's minds. Absolutely. Thanks very much for that, Scott. Uh, Scott, I'm just going to leave it showing your screen so that if there's any, um, you know, uh, answers that involve slides, then what people are just still looking at your screen since they can't see us. I'm not sure if everyone saw the answer that was in the sort of Q&A box, but we cannot include webcams today because the, there just isn't enough bandwidth in the world. 
uh, for GoToWebinar to have webcams today, which is not that surprising in the current environment. Anyways, that's why that's happening, but uh, thankfully we can all still hear each other and see Scott's screen. So um, let's ask about um, cash position, uh, whether you have the capital you need to advance all of these projects, um, and uh, if not, when when do you envision raising capital? Yeah, good question. So then I can just sort of put up slides to talk in context to that. So, you know, at the end of, end of Feb, we're at 2.6 million Canadian uh, in the bank, a little bit down from that today. Obviously, we've been continuing to drill in FG Gold. However, we had, uh, because of some tax reasons, prepaid a lot of the engineering work on Imperial. So we were working off, working down on uh, prepays. So I think it's uh, you know kept our cash burn recently uh, to as, as low as we can get it. Having to close our office and doing everything remotely and stay off airplanes has also helped us. So you know, current shareholders should uh, take some comfort that we've cut back all of the spending that doesn't materially impact any of the news flow. So we've not cut back anything that would stop submission of the PO to start permitting at Imperial. We've continued to drill at FG Gold. And so far, we're continuing to you know, permit all of the drilling across our portfolio. Um, second part of your question was, you know, what, what's the sort of forecast for cash look like? So we're going to wrap up drilling for FG. We've then got a series over the next couple months of uh, assaying and getting out those drill results. And then we've got the start of permitting with the plan operations for Imperial and some expiration news from geophysics at the regional expiration. So we've got news flow coming with the current cash. After that, we wanna to look to the market to say, hey, look, Core has got real strong expiration opportunities here, and we will need to raise additional capital at that point to fund going forward. How do we do that? You know, We're currently getting multiple inbounds from strategic interest in the company, so obviously we're gonna consider all those and if the market's not cooperative with a, a, a higher share price than where we are today, we'll look to some type of entity that's willing to pay a premium. So that'd be choice number one. If the market's cooperative and we're well above Eric Sprott's clean 30 cents a share, so he did not get any warrants. So, you know, kind of the price marker is uh, 30 cents a share. You know, if uh, we're in a situation, we've got the right market price, uh, we'll go out and raise some money in the market in, you know, late Q2 or Q3 to fund our exploration activities in the fall and keep the news rolling in core. Gotcha. Makes sense. Okay. Um, since obviously that answer included valuation, why don't I bring in a question about that, which is why do you think there is? I mean, you've outlined, <clears throat> excuse me, that your um, multiple is lower than it is for many of your peers. Why do you think there is a valuation gap? between core and um, pertinent peer uh, developers? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, I chalk it up to a couple reasons. I mean, I think the first reason is core is still very new, right? So even though it went public in November of 2018, which theoretically gives us, what is that, 17 months of, of trading history, the company didn't get any real capital until Macquarie's investment in May. We didn't get a management team in place and the ability to actually go work on the ground until you know Eric's investment and getting the team together just after the Denver Gold Forum. So call that late September. Uh, we then went out in the field, started working the assets, and only started delivering news flow in the company in the first part of this year. So uh, bringing all that back around, part of it is we have not had a lot of eyeballs in the story. We haven't had a lot of fundamental work done on the assets to prove that they're worthy of better valuation. So my first is core is still new. I think that can be improved by things like we're doing right here today, telling the core story to more and more people. And given the large number of inbounds and different opportunities that I have not seen before in, in the previous nine months at core, I think we're starting to get into some of those corners of the market and attract some attention. People saying, oh, oh this company really does have real assets. And I think I'm going to look at the valuation point and see if that's something for me. So getting more eyeballs in the name, I think, can, you know, it's not a company, maybe put it another way, it's not a company that lived through the last cycle and has been around for 10 years. And you're just trying to get back to some valuation point. Everyone understands what it is, right? Like a like an ore zone or a, another story that's sort of been through that cycle and you kind of know what you're getting to. Core's at, and core is new and the assets are new. 
None of the assets in the company have seen a drill bit in, you know, 15 to 30 years. So I think we have to demonstrate to the market we're worthy of that value. And good news, that doesn't take a lot of money because of the nature of our assets. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, one of the next pieces of news um, out from you guys will be <clears throat> drill re results from the drilling that you're, the, you know, the recent and ongoing drilling up at FG in British Columbia. Yep. What you're obviously drilling to try and um, understand and better delineate the high grade that's within um, a lower grade resource that's up there. What kind of drill results do you want to see? Like, what would you think of as success um, on that drill program? What would you think, uh, yeah, out, coming out of that FG drill effort, what would you call a success? So, you know, to be absolutely clear, to you know, make sure like, we are re-drilling a, you can look at that little cross-section chart and say we are re-drilling the high-grade components of a current resource. Mm -hmm. So what we want to get out of that is we want to get good core recovery, which has never been done before, or very inconsistently done before in the project, so we can truly understand the gold grades, because it's a nuggety ore body, and we've got to do both fire assays and full metallics to get a really good handle on what that looks like. And full core recovery, because we're using oriented core, will allow us to really understand that structure. So I would like to see, you know, five to 10 grams over good widths in that top, you know, 50 to at most 100 meters. But most importantly, we'd like to see brand new mineralization intercepts in underground kind of grades. So, you know, five plus significant widths deeper in that deposit down to the, you know, 100 to 200 meter below down plunge to show this continues. Because ultimately, we want to show people that there is an underground opportunity because it opens up a huge amount of rock mass to exploration. And we do have some great grades right at the surface so you could have some open pit component at the beginning we need significant continuous widths of five gram plus material gotcha yeah that, that so, would be a nice news release for sure yeah we're talking, um, we're talking good grades here yeah let's uh shift over to imperial we're going to wrap up pretty soon here everyone there's a few more questions in the queue i hope everyone has realized that you can submit questions um through the go to webinar uh, system here it's just a it's just a text like type them in and they show up on my screen so if anybody else has questions please enter them uh, I have a few more to get through here one of them is um, is sort of understanding the valuation of Imperial obviously the PEA is a big part of that um, the backstory of Imperial um, the, we're not going to get into the long backstory of permitting Imperial right now because it's a long story but uh, what I wanted what the question is getting at here is timelines on permitting um, yeah. and there's a few angles to that here so what is the timeline on permitting um, and how do you think that plays into core as uh, an M&A target in this gold market um, yeah. you know you're obviously talking to potential to interested strategics who obviously would be the same kinds of companies who would be interested in in deals if they're going to happen so yeah what's the timeline for permitting and how do you think that plays into core's uh, potential as an M&A target that's right so engineers are currently so key to permitting on Bureau of Land Management federal land in the United States is what's called a plan of operations that kicks off the formal permitting process. So we expect to submit that document the middle of this year. So a couple months, it's actually not all that of a complicated document. Um, the BLM then looks at that document, will probably will ask us to complete an EIR EIS, which is actually an update because all there is actually a plan of operations and an EIS EIR already on file with the BLM. It just doesn't comply with backfilling. So we're updating both those documents for backfilling. We expect it'll be a one-year process to get those approved by the BLM. That means approved for a public review process. Then there's a one-year mandated by the Trump administration maximum one-year review process. So you'd, we'd expect two years to a record of decision, which allows you to construct a mine on federal land. It's actually breaking ground on the project. We'd expect another year of that after that to go through financing to get your local permits like water and road use and dust and then ultimately we could uh, break ground on the project in three years we're able to do that that's actually a very quick timeline for a, a u.s project because of all the past work done and the fact that all these documents are currently on file uh, with the blm and just have to be updated we also have a supportive federal administration a supportive local county who's looking for economic development's got lots of tailwinds 
the second part of that question and, and, is, and is why buy stock if I got to wait for three years for a permit? Or, or, or to construct, right? My answer to that is Core's valuation today. Um, you know, if I buying stock today, if I wasn't an insider, I'd be looking to sell that stock to institutions when Core, you know, hits that hundred million market cap. You know, Gwen, you said at the beginning, you said right now it's a market of have and have nots. If Core was already a hundred million dollar company, we could go out and raise ten million in a bot deal in a heartbeat because there's institutions that want to play juniors. Core does not yet have the liquidity to attract institutions and doesn't yet have the market cap. So one exit for any investor today is to sell into institutional interest, core going on to ETFs, core going onto the radar screen as a developer. And I don't think that takes much material uh, de-risking of that permitting process from where we are today. And then fundamentally, I think there's also uh, the M&A outline at some point down the path. I don't think Core ever brings this project into production. To be absolutely frank, we're going to do it like we'll have to. But ultimately, a mid-tier looking for growth at some de-risking point here, we believe will probably buy the project uh, and/or the company. So, like, there's uh, there's several paths to exit long before we ever get to a, a permit. Sounds good. Okay. Um... Let's look at gold. There's a question here around the gold price. So um, obviously we've got a, a very nice gold price today. Uh, you used 1450 in your PEA. Can you talk a little bit about um, the, I guess, the, the question is about um, if gold goes stays at current levels, you know, or 1600, 1700, what does that do to the value of Imperial? Um, I mean, the question is also targeted at me in terms of what do we think that does for the valuations of stocks as a whole, I think the gold price is still just getting absorbed into the stock market. Like if you look at most analyst number crunching, uh, even for major miners, they are not yet reflecting current gold prices. Um, their share prices, share prices show a significant discount to the gold price based on historic um, ratios. And so we're still playing catch up on that. And that's because of the, the hit from COVID. That's because of the fact that the gold market was only just getting started when the COVID hit happened. Um, so I think there's a lot of uh, re-rating across the board um, on gold stocks that, that will start with the majors and come on down. Specific to core, though, for you, Scott, um, why don't you talk at least about, um, you know, at a 1600 or yep, what, what number quick. you want to choose, gold price, what does that do for the, the metrics at Imperial? I don't know if you can see it on your screen. Maybe it didn't switch. I put up a different, I put up the sensitivity chart. So, you know, like all gold projects, there's yep. great leverage to our project, to the gold price. But I think more importantly, an increasing gold price will attract capital. You've already seen big companies, you know, getting close to their navs. That'll flow down to mid tiers. And what does an investor want after, after the gold price is baked in? They want growth. So I think the, the stronger the gold price gets, the more capital will come to the sector, the more that capital will flow down to small caps like core. You'll see institutions looking for smaller and smaller and smaller companies to invest in. That's again, a great rotation opportunity for uh, retail investors that already own the stock. It gives opens up the door for M&A opportunities, and it makes sure Core can, you know, capitalize the company to fit our opportunities without unnecessarily diluting owners like myself and like hopefully some of you on the phone. Okay, then I think maybe as our last question, because we're hitting the one hour mark here, but why don't we wrap up with this? Um, the question is, what do you think um, were the top two or three reasons that Eric Sprott chose to invest in Core? And I would add to that, um, Eric usually likes to get warrants, and you noted earlier that this was a clean investment in that, by which you mean he did not get any warrants. So uh, curious about just how that conversation went. Um, yes, and the um reasons that he invested yeah i mean i mean eric was looking you know he he's he's a leader certainly a market leader he's looking for multiples on his returns he's not looking for percentages he's looking for you know multiples of of the money he puts in and i think it was, i think his investment thesis was very simple you know he at 30 cents a share you're getting three dollar fifty us per ounce gold in the ground and in a good gold market, right, those assets will be valued higher. They'll be sold to companies looking for growth. They'll, you know, increase value within the company they're in. 
and that'll generate the kind of multiples of return he's looking for. Ounces in the ground. Sounds good. And he likes exploration. Uh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He wanted us to explore. He wasn't, you know, the the the, the development side of it's great, but he wants increase the quality and quantity of those ounces you got in the ground. Go drill holes. Go get us some excitement. Gotcha. Um. All right. I guess the last thing I'll do is just quickly answer. Um, there was a question that came in that was uh, for me, as opposed to being about core, um, which was about uh, you know, uh, over the weekend, I sent out a note saying that it, it definitely is time to re-enter the market. And that note worked out well in terms of what happened with gold yesterday and today. Um, so what percentage of the portfolio did I invest back in? What percent do I still have left? Um, I only have about 15% of my capital left to deploy. Um, and to be honest, I wish I'd put it all in on, on Monday morning. So um, I really am comfortable um, putting money into the market at this point. I really think that the outlook for this gold bull market is incredibly strong. Um, I just, I mean, I felt good about the outlook for the gold market in December and in November. Um, I thought that we were setting up well, the fundamentals were incredibly strong. Um, and then we had the COVID setback, but that has actually been um, actually a lever that has made things better. And so I am very comfortable having deployed capital. Um, I am looking right now to just sort of decide where to put the rest of that capital. Of course, I always leave some out. I do think that there will be financing opportunities coming for those explorers that don't have capital. Uh, so I want to keep a little bit left for that. Um, but I'm, I do not want to miss this boat. I don't want to miss any part of this boat. I think it's going to be a pretty exciting ride. And so, um, Hopefully this event has been helpful for all of you. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you, Scott, for the presentation. Of course, Thank if anybody you. has any questions for um, Core or Scott, um, you can easily find contact information for them on their website or through myself, whatever is easier for you. Um, and uh, thank you so much, everyone. Stay healthy, stay safe, and please be in touch if you have any questions. Thanks, Gwen. All right. Take care. Bye, Bye everyone.